Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Needham Commission on Disabilities uh, September 19th uh, monthly meeting. Welcome back from our summer break. Good to see everybody. And um, we have somebody new to welcome this evening. So Stephanie Wyman, we'd like to start by welcoming you. Um, Stephanie is the new Director of Special Education. Do I have that title right, Stephanie? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Um, replacing Julie Muse Fisher, who we will miss and certainly thank for her service. Um, and it also looks like we have a guest. Anne, um, would you like to introduce yourself? And that's okay if not, um, we'll just go right ahead. Um, so for uh, Stephanie, I thought it would be nice if we could just go around and introduce ourselves. Um, so I am starting. Um, so I'm Carol Thomas, one of the co-chairs um, and I'll pass it off to Jeannie. Jeannie Martin and I'm a co-chair. Nice to meet you. And Hi, I'm Babs Moss. Welcome. I'm a com committee member. I'm Alexa Moore. I'm Alexa Moore. I didn't mean to cut you off there, Babs. I'm also a committee member and the secretary for the group. Nice to meet you. I'm Maureen Callahan, a committee member. Hi, Stephanie. Nice to see you. I'm Lynn Rodman. Uh, I'm Diana Swanson, I'm the uh, town liaison, and I'm also a member of the Newman Commission on Disabilities. And Officer Kelly. Hi, I'm Officer Kelly Scopinetti. I met you before. Welcome to the group, and I am the liaison for the MPD. Excellent. Hi, everybody. I am, uh, again, Stephanie Wyman. Hi, Maureen. It's nice to see you, a familiar face <laughs> from the past. Um, and it's great to be a part of the group. Excellent. And so I know in the past that you'd been rotating responsibility with the three of you. Will you continue to do that? Yes. Trish, okay. Danny, and I will. Yep. Okay. That sounds good. So we'll just send the agenda to all of you and whoever shows up will be welcome and we can go from there. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. So everybody should have a copy of the agenda. Um, and our first action is to approve the minutes from the June 20th meeting, which I sent out with the... Um, the agenda for tonight. Um, so I would entertain a motion to, or is there any discussion or questions about the minutes? If not, we'd entertain a motion to approve the um, minutes as read. I make a motion to uh, approve the minutes. Thank you, Babs. A second? Second. Thanks, Maureen. All in favor? Raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Yeah. Oh, oh no. we have to do a roll call. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Yep, I got it. So, um, <laughs> so I'm Carol, and I approve. A uh, genie, I approve. Babs, I approve. Maureen, I approve. Alexa, I approve. And do the liaisons vote? I don't think so. I do. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not Kelly. I do. Yeah. Um. I. Yeah. I, yeah. And Tatiana. Okay. Um. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so we, the first order of business here is the co-chairperson's report. So we got um, kicked off with the welcome of Stephanie Wyman. Um, and uh, next up, Jeannie, was the reverse 911 um, link. Do you want to talk about that? Yes. Um, I got a call from Elaine Saunders this summer. She was, you know, this is when we started to have all the storms and weather alerts. And she was con she had signed up previously or thought she had for reverse nine one, but hadn't heard from anyone during all the storms that we had. So she asked me to look into it. So I did. I contacted both police and fire, and eventually I came up. And I'm having trouble pulling it up on my other computer, but I do we do we have it somewhere. I did find the link. It's in the town website, and it's not called. Reverse nine one. It has another name. Maybe you know Kelly. It's called. No, I don't. Um, um I can't access. Hold on. We can put it in the minutes. We can send it to. Yeah. Alexa and put um. It in the anyway, minutes. there is a form that you fill out online, and I did that for Elaine. And then at the end, we found out she was already signed up, but there was she was able to add some extra information. So you can add as much or as little information you want about yourself in terms of whether you have a disability, whether you want to be contacted via email or phone. Um, but they are technically supposed to 
um, there you go. It's Thank called you. Alert Needham. There we go. Yep. Hmm. Um, so I signed Elaine up and I signed myself up. And this is several weeks ago, if, if not a couple months ago. And we never got even neither of us got any alerts. So I don't know what it takes to get an alert because we have had some serious storms. Um, but I still think it's a good idea for people um, who wish to be alerted either by email or by phone. But what happens is if there's any emergency information the town wants to give out, they will call or call, text, or email you just depending on your preference. Okay, so you're saying that you have not received a notification from the service ever? Correct. Since I signed up, I have not, there's nothing, there was no alert. There were no alerts. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Michael Lethin, who's the emergency management administrator for the town, when was the last email alert sent through the service? And I'll make sure if you're not, if it's within a day where you had already signed up and you didn't receive it, I'm just going to have him double check that you and Elena are, are signed up or that there's no deficiencies with the system. Yeah. And I have checked with Elaine and she has not received any alerts either. Okay. But maybe it takes something really drastic before they alert. But, you know, we had a couple like tornado watches and hurricane yep. watches. I would have thought something would have come out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's check it out. There, there is a way to sign up for it. Well, I guess so it's not we clear wouldn't what, we're do, what I, what I heard. And I think Maureen, were you, you were at the presentation on Monday, I thought. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I, I think he said that these are alerts that are more localized and they don't rise to the level of like a MEMA or like a state alert. Was that your understanding, Maureen? Yeah, I think it's Needham specific um, yeah. for the town. Uh, I know they use it for uh, like someone's lost, like somebody, I, I've, I've gotten those that there's somebody, uh, elderly person with Alzheimer's, for instance, in this sort of last scene, and they've used it for that kind of a thing. And I do know that, um, I can't remember the other ones I've received though, I've got to say, I'm not sure. Uh, like, um, yeah, so I think it, it is supposed to be like localized alert. So if there was a threat to directly to Needham, like that flash flooding, which we didn't have time to alert anyone about, um, that would have been something that would have come through the system. But I can get clarification. I just want to make sure that if there was an alert sent on a date after you signed up, that you that we, we check on why it does not go in through for sure. Okay, great. That's it for the for that item. Okay. Um, and moving on, Jeannie, I can take the new members one. And before I do that, um, as you may have already noticed, Stephanie Gray is not with us. I had sent an email earlier. I got so excited about Stephanie Wyman. I forgot to talk about Stephanie Gray. Um, and she um, had reached out to us to find out more about who we are and what we do. She works for um, Jake Ockenkloss's office. Hopefully I said that correctly. Um, and so she had a family emergency and couldn't join tonight as she was planning. So she um, will be with us um, hopefully at the October meeting. Mm -hmm. And I think she just wants to observe and understand more about um, who we are and what we do. And we'll give her a little bit of a chance to introduce herself. Um, and she coordinates um, disability programs for his office. Um, so I sent an email earlier today about that. Um, so back to the um, chair report on the new member update. Um, so Lynn interviewed um, with um, the town and Jeannie and I. Jeannie and I gave her two thumbs up. So um, she'll be voted on at the next select board meeting, which I think is later this month. And then and we'll, and we'll hear after that. So stay tuned for more details. And Lynn, we're, we're glad to have yeah. you participating. <laughs> um, and we'll let everybody know when it's official. Um, so moving on, there's the accessible playground update, Jeannie, that's coming up next. Um, yes, I happened to vacation with my family, including grandchildren um, in Mystic, Connecticut this summer. And we just stumbled onto this incredible playground. It's called the Grattan Tercentennial Playground. And um, there's a sign on the playground, I sent you pictures of it. Um, there's a sign describing a little bit about the process, but I wanted to know more. So I talked to the 
fellow in Park and Rec at Groton. And he was very, very nice and is um, willing to talk with us in the future should we want some real nuts and bolts kind of um, advice from them. But generally, I can say the prog the idea for their um, playground started in 2005. So it took them a couple of years to do fundraising and figure out what they wanted. It was finally installed in 2007 to nine. The fellow I talked to, Mark Berry, he was not around at that time. He's been with the Park and Rec 10 years. So he was just reading from notes and from um, people that he had spoken to about the playground process. And I'm trying to pull up my notes on an, my other computer and I can't access it. But some highlights, should we, oh, oh wrong set of slides. That's the accessible trail. The playground was, they made a very concerted effort to make it accessible for all and really focused on a lot of different kinds of disabilities. And it has things like a board where you can learn Braille. Oh, There's a lot of um, sensory activities with sifting sand. Is that uh, it? Mm. Nope, that's the accessible trail. Oh, then that wasn't the same. Okay. I sent two separate emails the other one this is the accessible braille trail correct that's why right there should be one called playground, playground. playground. i think you called it the playground let me just um find those i set them I put them aside in separate um i, I think you separate you called it playground one and playground i thought two. yeah i thought this was part of the playground um hold on, let me just pull that up one second Playground part. Um, okay. Oh, that's right. Okay, one second. I'm pulling them up right now. Okay, so I'll just pull them up. This is it, correct? Yeah. Yes. yes. Tercentennial Legacy Playground. Um, I will send my full notes out in an email, I we don't need to go over it in detail, but it's really a wonderful playground with a lot of interesting equipment, some things I had never seen before. Um, and I found out who they're, uh, they use two different vendors, someone in Medway, Mass called Mick O'Brien and Son. And oh yeah. And uh, this is a very interesting piece, has a lot of different, um, sensory related activities. It's a very long kind of train of things. I was there with a five-year-old and two and a half-year-old and they loved it. They were just so many interesting things for them on the playground. Um, some of the highlights of the notes, my conversation with Mark Berry. This is awesome. Um, so the playground project, it was, um, there was a committee established to work on it. Park and Rec was involved, but basically the fundraising and the planning of it was done by a, a committee of volunteers, which I think is important to think about as we move forward. Park and Rec was involved, but they were not in charge. It was really a, a committee that, uh, came up with the plan and did the fundraising. And the fundraising took all sorts of um, forms. They had a um, plaques. You could you know, put your name on a plaque for a certain amount of money. They reached out to civic groups, to local businesses. They had lemonade stands. He said something about selling merchandise related to the playground I think they made t-shirts or something that's you know like I'm for the playground or whatever and they sold all sorts of ways to raise money and they ended up he thought that this is back in 2007 it was about $350,000 back then and I'm sure it's a ton more than that now this is you know on a, a two-sided board with some braille activities just had some really interesting things yeah, um, that's terrific. I've never seen anything like that with a braille. This, a yeah. It'd be nice to incorporate some of these kinds of um, features and 
the tot lot that they're doing over at DeFazio. Now, this is the sand area um, that was very popular with my two grandkids. Unfortunately, one of the things Mark said when I asked him, what are some of the lessons learned? He said, forget the sand. He said, it's a pain in the it's a, a pain. Um, the sand blows everywhere. They spend a lot of time raking it and blowing it. And it attracts bees. Oh, so we said if they had it yeah. to do over again, they would not have a sandy bottom for any part of the playground. It's too bad because my granddaughter loved this little sifting activity. The other lessons learned, he said, they do have a gazebo in the middle of the playground. That's nice for, there's an, another sifting. Um, there's a nice area for family members, caretakers, whatever. You can see a little bit of the gazebo there, which is very nice. He said, but the entire playground lacks shade. And they would, they, in fact, they're planning to do sales, you know, these. Yes. Because they said I believe the just, school department has some, at least at the Newman School, I think, for their lunch area. They bought a, a big sale. So he said they really need to, you know, they wish they had focused more on shading part of the playground and they're going to have to do it now. Um, they also said several parents have asked for a fence around the perimeter that especially mm -hmm. if you're there with more than one child, it's very hard to keep track of them. And for safety concerns, they wish they had and probably will add a fence around the entire playground. Um, Jeannie, can I ask you a question? So yeah. this was funded by volunteers? Yes. So who maintains what? it? The volunteers? No. They, thank you, I skipped over that part. The park and rec was involved but not in charge of the planning and the building. Um, but now they do what they call a playground audit every two years. They're mandated. And it's done not by the park and rec, but it's done by the liability insurance rep. Mm -hmm. And they come in every two years and check it out. The park and rec does go through and look at it periodically. You know, they're trying to maintain it, but this official audit is done by the liability rep every two years. Um, Mark said that it's really been quite expensive to maintain. One of the problems is in order to maintain um, the uh, their proper coverage for liability, if something breaks, they have to replace it with parts from the manufacturer. And he said the slides break a lot. They get cracks in the slides. And just recently they had to replace, I think he said a 12 or 18 inch length of the slide and it cost $1,200 because wow. it, you know, there was just no other way. I mean, I don't know how you could get a part portion of a slide at, you know, Ace Hardware, but they have to go to the manufacturer. One of the swings, the strapping on the swing said an 18 inch length of three quarter inch strapping broke on one of the swings. It cost a couple hundred dollars. Again, he said we could have gotten that at Home Depot, but they can't. They have to go to the manufacturer to, to maintain um so I'm sorry, I must have missed it. But then who does the maintenance? Who's paying for all of these repairs? Park and Rec is. Okay, so they fund it with, you know, crowdsourcing the volunteers, but then they turn it over to Park and Rec to do the maintenance. I believe so. Uh, you know, it's possible that they're continuing to do some fundraising to help maintain it um, or, or will need to because he said they've just been overwhelmed by the kind of money that needs to be spent to maintain it right yeah so that's that's a big consideration for sure yep um what else do i want to say he said it's a very well they have 24 playgrounds in the town of groton this is the jewel in the crown as he called it um so they have a lot to cover but this is where they spend a lot of their time keeping up this one Mm. Um, I think that's the highlights of my discussion with him. But I guess I'm wondering, you know, where do we stand in terms of 
a playground initiative for Needham. So that initiative is with the Park and Rec. Perhaps it's time to start up the conversation again. Um, I know that during the summer, the Park and Recreation Department isn't able to focus on anything that's not pool or activities related. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking now is the time when they will pick up again with the playground. Uh, Babs, Karen and I attended a meeting. Babs, remember that? Yes, yes, um, yes. We, we they, did. They were on a timetable, weren't they, for each yeah. playground? And There's the a capital article to address each of the playgrounds with ADA um, recommendations um, over a certain period of time. So there is some funding, maybe not enough to do all of this beautiful stuff, but um, but perhaps it warrants a conversation once again with the Park and Rec Commission. We did ask them at that time to like let us know and, and let us partner with them on this, um, but I haven't heard anything back. I don't know if anyone else has. No. Yes, or maybe do one of the things. I mean, there's so many great ideas, you know, just incorporate, right. you know, one of the things that might be lowest maintenance, not a slide or a slide. Right, <laughs> just like, and, I, and again, I know that the uh, playground um, plan includes ADA features and ADA, mm -hmm. um, you know, accessibility features, but specific to what those are, I'm not, I'm not aware, but we, I think it might be time to just start up the conversation with the Park and Red Commission. Okay. So we'll take that as an action item then. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And there are, I don't, but there are a lot of, um, at the new Sunita playground, a lot of um, sensory friendly items. So I don't know if it's worth, or if anybody wants me to see who they used for some of that. Um, for yeah. the most part, it is the same vendor because these okay. vendors, Emmy O'Brien and Sons is on the state contract. They're well-known okay. for the playground. Um, so it's, it is most likely that we use um, that vendor or a vendor on, a, on another state contract. And we have, you know, the smaller one for the younger grades and the larger one. Yeah. Now, um, Stephanie, are, is, is the entire, is the public welcome to use that playground at any time of day? I would imagine not. Not during school day. Not right. in the school day. So in the afternoon, right. yeah. the playground remains open late into yeah. the, the day so that families can use it. It's my understanding, yes. Thank you. And is the, the Elliott School playground in the summer is not open unless school is open, the school is open, correct? I would have to check on that. Um, yeah, probably because I went. I took my oh. grandson and we went, couldn't, the gate was locked. We, oh. not, they don't want people there and the, you know, schools are not for operation, not open. Got it. Oh. Hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Well, that was a great discussion. Um, Jeannie, thank you for getting that started and sharing all those great pictures. And that was a wealth of information that you shared. So thank you for that. Um, so I am going to move us on if there's nothing else on the playground. We've got our action item mm -hmm. um, okay. to um, the accessible trails. And yeah. we were going to do some benchmarking um, or, you know, investigating over the summer and find some, you know, things that we like that we wanted to recommend uh, for the Muzzy site. But when we were having the, our pre-meeting conference, um, Judy mentioned that, um, She'd heard that there was a delay potentially in the Muzzy pro uh, project. Does anybody know about that? Did anybody else see that or hear? So anyway, Tatiana is going to uh, reach out to the architects to find out um, what the timetable is. And they presented a year ago now um, to our committee and we had a, a year or two at the time. So we're going to find out what the timeline is for making our recommendations. And then we can put together um, some recommendations for the accessible trail. I heard that the buyer fell through and that they were looking for a new sort of, not the developer, but the developer was looking for a new like occupant for the space that they're building. So I don't know. That's so, all I heard about them. Hmm. Yeah. So maybe that did cause a delay. So anyway, we're going to find out. if that would affect the accessible trail that they had in mind for this site. I don't know, but That's why don't we find out, you know, and they were open to our recommendations and we can certainly make some, um, but we let's just find out the timetable and if that's still a going concern. Mm -hmm. um, okay. All right, anything else on the, or do you want to share, Jeannie, your accessible trail? Yeah, so Alexa and I and her son, I've forgotten his name, Alexa. Cormac. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we went uh, to the Watertown Riverfront Park Braille Trail back in June. And first of all, it was very hard to find. <laughs> it's not 
<laughs> there's not good signage. There's not really any accessible parking near it. You're um, but we did eventually find it. And I would say it wasn't real impressive. But there were a few things that um, were of note. Jump in anytime you want to say something, Alexa. So throughout the trail, there are these markers, granite markers um, with a this rope. It's not really a rope. It's a covered nylon rope um, leading someone from spot to spot on the trail. And if you go to the next slide, I hope... It, it will show you the close-up of, on one side, there are words, and on the flip side, um, it's Braille. Up here? Yep. Yeah. That's cool. Although it's it seems to be in an awkward position, because as you're facing it, it kind of comes to a point, and the, and the Braille is on, like, the downslope on the backside of the trail, of the... This does this um, guy, does he go in front of that pillar? Yes. Okay, so if somebody's walking alone, they could miss the pillar. They would need to- I think those bigger um, blocks there on the line indicate that that's a place to stop. That gotcha. there's something there. I think that's what we have also at the Reservoir Trail. Don't we have mm -hmm. like, every so often you have like a, a, a big block that signals that you have to stop? Yes, I, I walk that almost every day. So I'm pretty good with that trail So with my mom. yeah. So that's a look at the trail through the woods. Um, there are a few markers here and there that talk about some of the um, natural environment that you could witness. Um, I think there's something about salamanders. There's a, a place to sit there on the left, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's it's short. I think it's a quarter mile in total. It's it's not very long. They do have this area in kind of the middle of it with these boats that you can sit in. Huh. Other than that, I didn't really understand what they offer. The boats aren't very accessible. Yeah, I think there was oh. one other sort of sensory activity that you could play. There's uh, a xylophone behind yeah, it which is coming. Yeah. But the boats themselves are I didn't really understand what that's all about. Uh, yeah, probably just for photo opportunity, like, you know, put the little kids in there and take a picture. Yeah, yeah. or maybe meditation but, or something. I don't know. But you can see in this sort of behind it, the um, xylophone and right. actually the keys. It's hard to tell in this one, but the keys are marked with Braille as well. Oh, nice. Let me see. And then they had a couple places to sit that were unique, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, there's kind of a curvature. I, I'm not positive, but I guess that would be an accessible place, you know, easy enough to transfer from a wheelchair, maybe. It's a, you know, firm surface. It looks it, right? Because it's isn't it like 30 something or 20 something. <laughs> it's been a while, Bob, since we've done a bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not impressed with uh, th these features for somebody who is visually impaired, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. So that was our visit. And this is the Watertown Braille Trail, correct? Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, the more we can incorporate uh, accessibility, even if it's not super impressive, but there's but it's addressing certain in any way, I think that's we should include it in our recommendations. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I did visually also... impaired wouldn't know there were boats there. How do they know there were boats there? And also uh, the rocks, it's kind of um, right indicating you know, un uneven. Yeah, I was just also going to share that I did see a post on, I think it was an Arlington um, Disability Commission website that they had a an accessible trail where visitors were able to rent like mobility devices. So like mm -hmm. um, scooters and things like that to help people access the trail. Um, so I don't know if that's something that we would consider recommending, but they had them available for rental there or for um, 
just for people to borrow as well. I don't know if you did. Do they rent them with the town staff or like where do they access the scooters? I don't know. I, I just saw it posted that it was like a, a nice feature that someone had posted that they enjoyed. Did you um, say Lexington? Was that Lexington? Um, Ar- I think it was Arlington. Arlington. Yeah. Arlington. My daughter lives in Arlington. I don't mind checking that one out. So okay. I'll see if I can find that. I thought I took a screenshot of the um image, but I couldn't. I was looking for it before this meeting. I couldn't find it. I'll share it if I find it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Babs and I were going to go check out this one that is supposedly in Framingham that we cannot find. Um, I talked to David Korea and he told me it was by TJX, by the gas station. I looked all over the website, the town website. I, you know, contacted Metro West. I sent a note to the MOD. So anyway, um, I'm about to get, to give up, but there's plenty of other you know places we can go to, you know, do some investigations and get some good ideas. So um, anything else on accessible trails? and our efforts to find some good things to recommend. So as a takeaway, I'll confirm whether or not Muzzy site is still on call, whether the search for the new uh, tenant affects the accessible trail. And if it doesn't, then when do we need to have recommendations to them by? Perfect. And one feature to note, I guess, would be good signage for people so they find it because I felt the same way. You, uh, Jeannie, you said that one was hard to find, right? In Watertown. Yeah. Carol, you can't seem to find the one in Framingham. Karen and I found the one in Natick, but it wasn't well-marked at all. It was kind of behind these buildings and there was a lot there. You would never have thought that was going to be the entrance to a rail trail. Not at all. So Mm. yeah, good good signage, I guess, would be something we should put on the list. So people Mm. at least know it's there. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of signage, even at the accessible trail at the reservoir, you know, which I walk pretty frequently, you know, the rules are in teeny tiny print when you sort of walk up to it. And so there's so many kids around there and the defazio and the track is there. And so, you know, oftentimes I'll have to ask the the track kids that, you know, run there or they there's kids on bikes. There's not supposed to be any bikes or scooters, you know, oh, that, that yeah. you know, it's not allowed to so be easier if it was a little bit more prominent because they probably don't know. So, but it's scary for somebody that's not so steady. So, mm. yeah, and Maureen, to that point, I think one of the other things that came up during the previous visit and also with the Watertown one was the lack of sort of accessible parking. And then from where you're able to park, the ability to, you know, access the trail itself without going downhill or, you know, over grass or something like that. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't think there's enough um, thought given to that because Karen and I went together and she was in a wheelchair. And the trail itself was great. It was paved, it was smooth. It was it was very easy for her to maneuver, but getting from the parking lot onto the trail was kind of like broken pavement kind of in the area we were in. So that was a real oversight on the part of whoever had built that trail out because that just wasn't, you know, that's where a lot of people were gonna park. And it wasn't, it wasn't smooth getting onto that trail for her, not at all. Yeah. Mm. That's a good point. Um, all right. So we have lots of recommendations when the time comes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anything else on that before we move on? All right. So I'm going to take us then to the advocacy calls. Um, I can talk about one that I did with um, Judy White, who is a resident at 757 Highland Ave. And she had an issue with a property management company, which was Hamilton, when they were repaving the lot. And there were some um, construction equipment that was, number one, blocking her access out of her building. I actually went to meet with her um, in person and to see all of this. Um, And then um, they asked, while they were repaving, they asked the handicapped um, folks to park on grass or somewhere else that they couldn't get to. So that was her concern. And so um, I actually called and spoke to the management company, the Hamilton, and they said that they had sort of revised their process and they were doing it now in two steps and that they had paved half the parking lot. And then for the half where the handicapped parking was, they were going to relocate them to the already the newly paved part so that they wouldn't have to go somewhere else um, and it would be accessible. So I think that's how that did get resolved. And then I um, spent some time with her. She, I took downloaded some pictures from her phone and I um, shared with her some resources. She didn't know about the MOD or the Metro West Center for Independent Living and our website. So I gave her all those um, pieces of information. So that was how that one um, played out. Jeannie, were there any others or Tatiana? Not for me. Okay. Um, I just had uh, one from um, 
I don't know if it was, I mean, it was an advocacy call, but it was from a resident who suffers um, from a chemical disability and um, her house got flooded. Um, and so she was oh. asking for uh, us to advocate on behalf of her. But I made a number of calls um, to our departments. To I spoke to MEMA. I spoke to the Emergency Planning Committee. There's really nothing we can do for individuals um, in the town, unfortunately. We just legally were unable to reroute uh, public funding to a to the benefit of one person, um, which is something that we have spoke to uh, this particular individual in the past about. Um, but I still, she wanted to see if Mima could assess her home, if, you know, if there was anything else that the town could do. Um, and unfortunately, there, there just isn't. People are, uh, the town went as far as to try to declare the flooding event an emergency to ease some of the um, the claims that homeowners might have had with their uh, residencies that got flooded. But um, aside from that, there's really not much that we can do. Um, so advocacy call, but mostly also just trying to see what could be done on the emergency planning side. Um, so, um, and I, like I said, I spoke to a representative of MEMA who also stated that there's really not much we can do on that front. Yeah, I mean, other than share resources, yeah. One of the select board members at the most recent meeting had, because uh, it keeps coming up in public comment, of course, people suffered a lot of, some people really, had a lot of damage to their homes. And he asked if perhaps the town could think about setting up a fund so that people could apply for, you know, nothing, not thousands and thousands of dollars, but something to help sort of ease the burden. So that's something they might consider doing in the future. It'll be interesting to see if they do. Unfortunately, I think that with the weather patterns changing so rapidly, we are going to continue to see events of this nature, so, mm. you know, Freak yeah. storms. I think they call they call the last flash flooding that affected Needham a one thousand year storm or something like that. It was the amount of water that fell in that particular amount of time was so um so massive that you just our our catch basins couldn't keep up. So um to, yeah, so that will be that will be good if they can start some funding or something that you know where people can tap into for personal losses. Um, into their property. I don't know what that looks like, but that sounds like a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so the last topic on the co-chair report, we had a very robust one this evening, um, is the AAB um, violations and you do it electronic. So Jeannie is going to cover that. Yes. And the other one was at um, YMCA. Again, okay. I, I'm having yeah. trouble accessing my other computer to pull it up, but both uh, situations have been resolved. I received notices over the summer from AAB that uh, the, uh, I think it was a signage issue at You Do It, and that's been resolved. And at y YMCA, I'm just completely blanking and I don't have access to it, but um, both of those situations have been resolved. Yeah, so the YMCA one, um, this one started last year. Remember, we had a little bit of confusion on whether it was the pool site or the site by Chestnut Street, on Chestnut Street, rather. Um, and it was the site on Chestnut Street. And they um, had been fine, non-compliant. Um, uh, the, uh, they did not have proper signage. So the building owner corrected the striping and signage of the accessible parking space, bringing it into compliance. And they sent the pictures along with the proper um, uh, the proper signage now, which shows that there is not only um, the stencil on the on the parking spot, but also the bolted to the ground sign <laughs> indicating that it's a handicapped parking spot, that is at, at, at accessible parking spot. And the one from... I'm trying to pull it up um, for you do it electronics. I forget, was that a signage one too? I uh, visited it today. I visited the you do it electronics. Um, the signs are prominent. There are, I think three or four of them. And um, without one of the signs it says being accessible and between the parking spaces, you know, significant number of feet between each parking space for the van accessibility. 
So it sounds like with them is that they did not have sufficient um, spacing between the, the, the accessible parking spots and or sufficient number of parking spots. So they have corrected that now and that's also yeah. closed. I think. So that's great. Yeah. We didn't have to chase after them to get that done. Mm -hmm. All right, great. And then Bab, maybe while we're on this, uh, Babs visited the Landry parking area today or the parking near Landry Bicycle and Panera Bread. Uh, she sent me some photos and like we've seen in other places, they have put in the signs, but a couple of the signs are on the building and not in, not on poles. And I guess that's acceptable. Do we know for certain that that's acceptable that the sign be on the building that the parking lot, the parking space faces? Um, I don't know. I would have to Lynn, look it up. I don't know. Lynn just went through um, community <laughs> access monitor training. Bravo yeah. to that. Do you remember anything being said about I seem to remember that they had to be on poles. I don't think it was okay to put it on the buildings. I might be wrong, but I remember poles. Okay. The only thing I remember is that it has to be at eye level. Yeah, mm -hmm. certain height. Yeah. And they, they are at eye level. One thing that was an issue is, is um, the lines on the pavement are not clearly marked. It's very... Uh, Faded, including the um, the wheelchair um, thing on the ground, is um, is all faded. Yeah. So, so I we, guess it wouldn't hurt for us to get back in touch with the owner and say, you know, thank you for doing the signs, but you know, the markings need to be. Redone. It's the whole parking lot, not just there. It's the whole right, and lot. I'm sure that's again a huge expense, but it's something that needs to be done. I don't know if technically it's in violation if they're there, but just faded. Um, but it, I'll I'll follow up on that to a gentle reminder that um, that would be a great asset for everyone if if the you just remind me he did not move the accessible parking spots from where they were right. correct? that's correct he did okay. not he added the signs and the spaces are all down near panera and the number conforms to the guidelines but it just functionally it would have been nicer for them to have at least one near Landry bicycle, but he chose not to do that. No, that's not a violation. So, okay. Anything else um, on that topic? I think that's the end of our report. And Tatiana, we're going to hand it over to you for the ADA liaison report. Yeah. Hi. So I just have a few updates um, on the grant award um, that we approved last April. Um, kind of fell off my radar until Julie reminded me. So uh, we sent that over to the commission, to the select board, to approved. Um, that was done on August 15, and I I was told by the accounting department that the grant award has been dispersed. Stephanie, do you have you received the check? No, but I can look into that. Okay. Um, they told me that it's been dispersed. It might take I don't know a week to get to you or um whatever, but it that was for three thousand dollars for the purchase of equipment for the intensive learning center program. As always, we thank the schools for making use of our grant and uh, putting it to good use. <laughs> And um, I did see in the notes, I guess, I don't know if now's the time to ask, but that someone uh, that we were going to bring pictures in the fall, is that something that's already been done or should I work on that between now and the next meeting? And To put pictures, to bring us pictures? I that saw in the um, minutes from the last meeting in June that um, Julie and then um, was going to take some pictures of the new classroom to show everybody. Yes, I think that that was... Um something that we had done i think maureen you might have led that initiative the last grant award that we did we put we took some photos and put it in the news you need them to make residents aware um, of how the grant was used and also to help promote the fact that we have grant funding available for projects like that um so okay. i think it'd be great 
We, so we, I'll, I'll do that and um, have them ready for the next meeting. I, I apologize. Not at all. Uh, we we might want to include them in the annual report. I know there's some some space for pictures, so that will be helpful. We yeah. did have uh, that picture that Ma Maureen, I think you sent it from the wheelchairs that we purchased for the um, uh, community center, community council. Um, yeah. That is on the website as well to illustrate our our the use of our grants. Yeah, I mean, it would be great for us to see it, but I think we wanted to sort of promote it. So we would want to put it. it, you know, maybe we could have Karen put it on Facebook or we could get it into the news you need them because we had the the um, picture at the Needham Community Council there with the wheelchairs. So um, once you have them, um, Stephanie, we can get them posted. Um, Perfect. I will work on that um, in the coming week. Beautiful. All right. Um. So autism welcoming. Um. So we got, last time we met, I was still awaiting for a response on autism welcoming because when I involve um, um, Amy Halson, who's the director of communications and community engagement for the town of Needham to try to um, to promote this within the, the, the town's uh, local businesses, uh, you know, with the idea that the commission would um, help fund uh, this training, uh, which is provided to, you know, to to restaurants and departments, I'm sorry, restaurants and private and small businesses that want to train their staff into um, into being uh, more aware of how to deal with um, with um, clientele with uh, perhaps um, mental disabilities or autism. Um, so um, one a couple of the questions that we had was that Amy had in order to promote this was. Um, how does it work? You know, is the five hundred dollars per person? Is it per business? Um, what is it needed? And you know, do we have to pay directly to autism welcoming, or do we just do we disperse the money to the to the business for them to, you know, to use? So all of these types of questions. So I reached up back out to um, autism welcoming, but I did not hear from them until July thirty with a thousand apologies. So by then we had gone into our summer recess. Um, and so the um, the uh, operations outreach specialist for Autism Alliance, uh, Penny Anderson, um, sent me some information. Basically, the five hundred dollars is for the training of the business staff, so it's kind of a good deal because it's a you know you can get a lot of people trained with the five hundred dollars. Um, their goals is obviously autism education. Um, they also do they also do an assessment of the re of the of the business and recommend. Uh, um, make recommendations that are easily implemented. Uh, obviously they do this the employee training and they do have materials that they can distribute. And um, and of course they promote the business through their network. They have a network of families, um, social media posts, and basically they just highlight that business that took the training and then that hopefully uh, makes more people willing to go visit them because they know they received the training. So that's a little bit of a win-win on both sides too because they get uh, additional exposure um, for receiving the training. So um, I told Penny Anderson that I would bring this back to the commission because ultimately the commission has to make the decision on whether or not we want to fund um, this, uh, this training for a business that shows interest. And once we have that parameter, then, um, then I can let Amy know so we can start working on that. So $500 will cover the training just for one business? Yeah. Mm. So, um, yeah, and so, and they, that, that's the other thing. So Amy wanted to know whether the training, like, do do they send stuff to the person or does someone come over to them? And it sounds like it takes place on site. Um, so, and then you, again, Amy just wanted to know if the commission has any interest in placing stipulations on how to use the money, or if we just want to say the commission will pay autism welcoming directly for the training of your staff? It probably depend on how many want to take advantage of it and what we have in the budget. But I think we could also consider, well, first that some businesses might want to invest in that on their own without support from NCOD. And that those who do, if we can't fully fund it, maybe we can subsidize it so that it could be spread among more businesses. That's mm -hmm. true. Could we invite business owners to a seminar and they could be trained? Like a large group, you mean, Bab, so that 
it can just be done like once or twice a year or okay. I think from what Tatiana okay, said, they, they go to on site to inspect like the facility, like the the shop or the restaurant. It sounded like they did that, right, Tatiana? Yeah. So that might that not is, work. It, that is part of their services. So okay. Um, to provide some easily implementations. Um mm. it'd be great if we could just start with one place mm -hmm. and well, then or, just do well, marketing like crazy about what you know they went through and the result and how happy everyone is do we know a potential business that would want to do this well you know, so to alexa's point do we want to just start by promoting this and see if there's any interest and then if businesses do um show interest maybe we can discuss how ncog can pay can help pay for that if we get no interest, maybe the next time we promote this, we say partially or completely subsidized by the Commission on Disabilities. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how would what would be the best way for us to get the word out about this program? Well, the news you need them um, will be one that it sounded like Amy was, you know, on board to have it promoted that way. Um, I don't know who manages the town social media anymore, but I can I can try um, finding out and, and seeing if they will be willing to put that information there. Uh, obviously, we can put it on our own website. That's an easy fix, but we just don't get a lot of uh, traffic through our website. But yeah. um, There's also the new publication, the Needham Observer, which is online. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. It's called the Needham Observer? Yeah, it's, oh. it's great. They just started a few months ago. It's totally online. It, it's just a nonprofit. Um, organization they're doing a really good job of covering yeah the town news yeah. very good uh, the you. chamber of commerce it's yeah. all business members so the chamber might be another way to they do i think a twice a week newsletter that i get i mean they're they cover you know a number of different towns but they always clarify whether it's for which town like if there's a program or if there's a an event coming up or something so we could do that now, who puts out the Needham Observer? Peter O'Neill is the managing editor. I, I have his contact information. Okay. Well, so I, those are some venues to promote this. And like, I don't, to Alexa's point, we might just try promoting it without the, the funding um, caveat and see if people are able to take, you know, advantage of it on themselves, by themselves. Maureen, would you be willing to contact the Needham Observer, the fellow you at least know his name. Yep, Peter. Um, I could, yeah, I could call him. It might be that they would want to report on it after it's happened. You know what I mean? I could see them yeah. saying, "Oh, it would be really an interesting story to be able to interview a restaurant owner or, or you know, something um, about their experience." But I'll ask him and see how they determine, you know, what which stories or which items that they cover. And I'll and I'll uh, I'll give I'll get the answer for us. Yeah, maybe okay. he could do it as a larger story about like the things that this commission does and some of the things recently that have happened. There's an angle, <laughs> right? And I think he might, you know, that could be of interest because I know Peter through um, Special Education Parent Advisory Committee from many years ago. So we mm. have children with special needs. So that could be, uh, we could think about, you know, right, like some of the, yeah, doing an article about us essentially to kick it off and maybe discuss this as being a future, potential future or um, initiative that we uh, are going to be getting involved with or I'll see, I'll see. I'm not a newspaper person, but he is. And uh, see what might make an interesting story. I'm just wondering if anyone has any ideas of a particular restaurant store in Needham that would be a good place to start. Uh, maybe if we have any ideas Hearth. of what would- Hearth, yeah. What about a supermarket? Okay. What about a supermarket? Look, there's, a, there's lots of kids that cook too. That's right across in the town hall. And almost every time I'm in there, there's, there's young families. So that will be a good one too. 
Yeah. There was a restaurant too that I'm spacing on the name, but I can ask CPAC about it that did um, a sensory friendly evening. Um, it was a restaurant. I want to say it was last year or the year before. Um, they hosted a few evenings throughout the school year mm -hmm. um, that were sensory friendly. I cannot think of the name though right now. That's okay. Okay, so last Maureen um, and I went to the local emergency planning committee meeting um, of September update. Uh, and I um, just wanted to share the presentation quickly with all of you because I thought there was a lot of in interesting information. I actually, um, when I got it, I, I forwarded it to my staff as well because I think um, this is information that's relevant to everyone. Um, so let me just uh, pull that up real quick just to go through some of the highlights of the presentation. Um, so it's basically preparedness months. And like I said, um, because of all of the weather pattern, because of the changes in weather pattern that we are seeing, I think it's important for everyone to start thinking about things like this. I certainly don't have a kid as many times as I've been told to put one together. Um, so that's an initiative for us, for my family to, um, to get a kid going, to make a plan and to stay informed. Um, of course, one of the things that we recommend for people is to sign up for Alert Needham, but <laughs> we wanna make sure that it's working. So we will work on that as well. Uh, here's a list of things that your kid should have at a minimum, um, water, food, medications, um, cash, they said, which is uh, crazy to think about, but uh, you know, if, if ATMs or like power lines were to go down, we wouldn't be able to transact with our phones or anything. So having cash in hand is also important. Um, they said any kind of policy for important documents, flood policy, home policies, wills, things like that. Almost everything is digitized these days, but if you have paper copies, put them in a safe place, maybe a, a waterproof um, a container and um, also throw them into your kit. Um, and then hopefully it's here, but they did say, don't forget the pets. So if you have like cats and dogs and stuff, it is important that you also have um, a backup of their food, their medicine, any special you know treats or anything like that um, in the event that you have to evacuate with your pets. They highlighted that there's almost no shelter in Massachusetts that doesn't take pets. So don't leave your pets behind. They will be welcome wherever you are welcome. Um, so making a plan, they talked about um, how you should discuss with your family or the people that you live with, like what is going to be your, your you know, your meeting place, um, where you, you know, understand your evacuation routes outside of your town, where in your house could you shelter in place in the event that a torna tornado ever actually reaches, you know, this part of the, of the state, um, where in your house you're safe, like we actually had to talk about where in town hall could people shelter in place in the event that the tornado actually touched down in Needham or near Needham? And a lot of us did not know. That is, you know, the first floor bathrooms or the hallways or anywhere with an arch. Like we, we had to actually ask like, where are those places? And so we had to send that information out because tornadoes has, had not been really in the vocabulary of emergency <laughs> preparedness, but we're seeing a little bit of everything lately, right? Um, they recommend that you practice. Um, everyone should be changing their batteries and their fire alarms, the smoke alarms, um, mo mo monocarbon oxide, whatever, <laughs> alarms <laughs> twice a year. And so when you do those um, those testing, um, take, a, take advantage of the situation and run a fire drill with you and your family. Um, stay informed. These are all the different uh, news uh, outlets that, uh, that you can tap into to stay in form of different conditions should the power go out and, we, and we're not able to, you know, to obtain um, news through our cable system like most of us do. Uh, and then again, alert Needham, which will make sure that it's working. Uh, and then any questions and that was it. So I, I thought it was really good, just concise information to get you thinking about some of the things that might be helpful for you. Um, most people uh, have these kits or these, you know, ready in, you know, prepared kits in their house or their car, maybe one in each. Uh, and then just making sure that your family knows what your meeting rally is both for your home. And if you're, you know, in the event of an emergency within your house, or if you are outside, if you are all, you know, outside of the home, where are you going to meet? Like I could say, I will meet everyone in the need of downtown and you know whatever my daughter and my husband is that's where we're meeting in the case of a, a crisis or a catastrophe or whatever but if it's an, an emergency within my house I'm going to be like we're going to meet in this like underneath this particular tree 
an account for everyone. So I thought it was really, really um, uh, helpful. Um, like I said, I, I came back to the office and shared it with my staff. I think everyone should start thinking about that. Um, and I, Officer um, Kelly, while I have you, um, is there still a way for people with disabilities to sign up through the police department to let you know that there might be a person with a disability in the household? So this thing called, it's called at risk. Um, there's a form that, if they wanted to be in an at risk, um, they fill out and we make a binder. But it really doesn't give us like an alert, like how many people need assistance in certain areas. It's it's something that we really need to work on. Yeah. It's almost like they should be on a special um, reverse 911 calling would be great, you know, for like an NCOD list would be nice. You know, there's nothing really that we have. Okay. I think a long uh, time there was a, there was an initiative to try and sort of flag mm -hmm. those households with a disability. They have a flag. Like, so like, so for instance, say we went to a senior citizen's home and there's oxygen. You yeah. get a call. We have that red flag saying there's oxygen in yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. But you have to, as the person, initiate that information to the police department. Be proactive about it. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. We did promote this. Do you remember, Officer? We promoted this, or maybe it was a time when Officer Harmon was still here. But yeah, I think it was more than this. Officer yeah, Harman. we did promote this within the community, but I don't know if we got any additional takers out of that effort. Hmm. I think there are probably a lot of people who don't know about it. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that should probably be posted a few times a year just to remind people that it's out there, that this is. Um, something you can do if you have somebody with a disability or somebody elderly that has oxygen or anything. Yeah. Um, and this was all for police response, right? So if police or, or an ambulance- Fire was, too, yeah. I think. It's fire. fire. Right, yeah. it's public safety. So if public safety was called to a household, they would have anticipated the particular needs of that household um right. to, to to babs i mean to officers colponetti's points if there's oxygen if there's perhaps a person that um that has a speech impediment or a, a visual impediment mm -hmm. that they you know they will have that um that flag and perhaps you know change the equipment to come into the household so yeah and that's what we do with the at-risk um um young adults and senior citizens but as in for like disability as in wheelchair and wheelchairs or assistance assistance walking we don't really have anything unless like i said that resident initiates that information towards us so i finally i was forwarded the mini grant information from the massachusetts health um uh office of the of Officers Association. <laughs> Officers Association, yeah. Thank you, Health Association. Um, fortunately, our own director of health has uh, been on leave uh, for a personal reason. So we have, I've not been able to um, touch base with him on his plans. I do know that he was looking into it when I first got the email and I forwarded it on to him. Okay. And we just didn't have a chance to follow up. So, I'm, so I'm, I'm, when I know more, I will bring you an, a, a, better, a better update. Okay, um, that sounds good. That was from Thank Felix. you. And All that's right. it for me. Can okay, that's clarify real quick for the notes. What's M H O A? It's <laughs> Massachusetts Health Officers Association. I'll forward you the email from Felix. Uh, what do you mean? I wasn't clear. <laughs> yeah, while, while Julie's talking. <laughs> I'll like, that one off pretty quick. Spelled something. <laughs> yep, yep. I'll send it to you. Um, so I think that um, brings us to the report section and Jul uh, Stephanie, we'll kick it off with you on the schools. Um, sure, we are off to a very successful start um, in all of our school buildings. Um, we are, geez, in our fourth week already, um, if that seems possible, students returned um, before Labor Day. So um, we are off to a great start. Like I said, um, we have exciting things going on at the administration building and we've seen some pictures um, of what doesn't look like a lot yet, but has potential to be amazing. Um, and we are hoping um, again that there everybody's um, on track with that. And we are starting conversations 
around the potential of the new school building, the new middle school building, um, and including six, seven, eight. And so those discussions are happening as well. But students and teachers and faculty are all happy to be back in the building and glad the heat isn't what it was a few weeks ago. Um, so it's a little more comfortable in the buildings. Can I ask a question, Stephanie? Will that move us away from the model of having a dedicated sixth grade school? Potentially, yes. Wow. It would go back into, yeah, the um, middle school. Yep. Um, and then I guess I did just have a question being the newest member to the group, if there were specific items that you would like us, um, you know, or to think about for next time, um, you know, to bring updates on in terms of um, specific school buildings or, um, you know, what information or what specific information you're looking for us. Um, again, maybe that's already been established and I just have to go back to Danny and Trish. Um, but, you know, I'm, we're happy to kind of um, bring different information, you know, to the group if you want to on a month by month basis in terms of services that we offer within the schools. Yeah, so I think in the past it's been like updates about regard, you know, initiatives that your specific department is, 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 um, anticipating or um, anything that has to do with uh, advancing the needs of the school population when it comes to disabilities. Um, any projects that, you know, like like the, the middle school conversation. Um, uh, and I actually, I forgot in my section that I, I have some personal updates <laughs> that I meant to share with you as well. But um, I think you did meet the new building commissioner last June, Joe Prondex. So he joined the town in June of 2023. Um, we also have a new um, director of communication and community engagement. Her, her name is Amy Halson, and she um, she was our former economic development manager who got promoted into this position. We also um, have been, um, we also received notice during the summertime that our director of library, Kim Hewitt, um, had left us to go to another community. Uh, we're very happy for her, but um, she left a very big hole to fill. So we're in the process of recruiting for that position. Um, we are also in the final um, uh, stages of recruiting for a new economic development manager. Um, and then finally, I have a little update of myself. I've been promoted to the director of human resources for the town. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So um, lots of lots of changes, but we're doing okay. <laughs> Congratulations. A well-deserved yeah. promotion. Congratulations. Excellent. Thank you. All right. And, and Katie asked me, are you going to stay as a liaison? I'm like, I'm absolutely going to stay as a liaison. Oh, so, thank nice. goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that sounds good. Um, thank you, Stephanie. And if anybody has anything specifically they'd like to hear about, we can feel free to ask the school committee team. And, um, and remembering that we have more grant money. Yes. yes. And the grant budget now. Does anybody yep. know the balance that we have? I don't. I was waiting for this check to be cut so I could give you a good number mm -hmm. and I didn't. I forgot to go back and look. So, but I'll bring it to next meeting. Okay. That's great. And that's perhaps a good segue into some of these other updates. Um, so I actually think Felix isn't here for accessible parking. And I think we've talked through um, the issues as part of our earlier conversations. Um, we're looking for a liaison for the Needham Diversity Initiative, so I'm sort of standing in. The um, next event is um, the um, Diversity Summit on November 5th from 1 to 5 at Pollard. So I was actually just thinking that maybe we could have a table there um, or some information about our grants. And we could say, you know, here's the grant applications um, and show the pictures uh, from the um, schools that Stephanie's going to send and from the Needham Community Council, just to sort of put it out there that, you know, there's some grants available if you think that's appropriate. I would just, you know, or we could do some kind of a workshop. So anyway, we've got a little bit of time, but we, you know, have an opportunity to interact with them. Jeannie? That would be a good place to put out information about registering for um, what yeah. used to be E991. Yeah. yeah. I forgot yeah. what it's called already. And, and we have some brochures. I know, Tatiana, you've provided them in the past. Um, so I still have uh, some, yeah. Yeah. I have I have some, too. Actually, we're going to be doing the Harvest Fair. Okay. So uh, I'll bring those brochures, um, put them on my table again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. 
that's great. So I, anyway, um, just a thought. So that's the Need of Diversity Initiative. Um, and then um, Tatiana might have stolen all your thunder marine on the LEPC, but was there Sorry. anything else that you wanted to say? <laughs> it's nothing else I have to add other than Sorry. he recommended Sorry, the, the NOAA radio system so that it can give you weather alerts, whether you lose power or not. I thought that was kind of a good thing to remember. But uh, NOAA, the National Weather uh, whatever yes. Association. Okay. You can crank the radio, so you don't even need batteries that uh, good batteries that have failed can get charged and things yeah. like that. So I have one in the basement somewhere. Yeah, um, yeah. All right. Is there? Um, so those were the updates. Um, was there um, any other business, Jeannie? Well, I mentioned it briefly before, but I want to mention again that Lynn did attend um, community access monitor training oh. just last week or the week before. We're very excited that you did that, not even being officially a member yet. It shows a great dedication. I'm just wondering if there's anything in particular you want to share from your training. Well, it was a little overwhelming because it was everything from architectural, well, you know, the laws when they came into effect, you know, federally on the state level. And then they went through all kinds of architectural things, you know, parking, bathrooms, um, when, uh, for people that have uh, low vision, you know, how things stick out in buildings, it was, I mean, it was so much stuff, um, but it was really helpful for me just to have kind of a baseline of information. And, you know, there, of course, there's lots of resources that they have, you know, online that you can go to when you really want to check things out. And they do have um, a half day advanced training, which they do in person where they take people and they actually train them to check out something. But most of the people that were in their um, work for different towns, you know, all over the state that were, you know, already very familiar with a lot of things. And so they had lots of questions about real life things that they had already been involved with. So I was very much a newbie there, but it was a very good overview for me. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for doing that. It was a two-day event, I do believe. So yes. that's dedication for sure. So then did you mind me asking where they held it? Um, it was sponsored by the Worcester um city, but it was actually held on Zoom. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it was from 10 to 3 for two days. Mm -hmm. So um, so you know, it was good you didn't have to be in person. But I mean, they just went through through lots and lots of slides and lots of things, but and it was, you know, very, very helpful. It was interesting for me to learn about when different laws went into effect. And that was, that was really helpful. Great. Okay. I just had a question, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I was just wondering um, involvement or partnership with um, our CPACs throughout the district. Is that something that's um, a part of the group or sharing information the special education um, parent group through the town? Um, I've had a, two meetings with the the um, organization. We're trying to work on um, at-risk forms and maybe an online form where it's easier for the parents to get to us. But other than that, I haven't had any other involvement with them. Okay. Um, they have monthly meetings as well, and I guess I was just a lot of the topics covered here, I think, would be information that I would love to be able to, you know, bring mm -hmm. back to them because it it's as if, you know, all of the advocacy that both groups are doing are amazing for the town, but, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the things that they're working on, maybe something I could bring back to this group too, just to share as well. Sure. Uh, absolutely. I think that could be a good dialogue during your part of the agenda, so. Okay. Maybe we can get a liaison from the uh, CPAC also to join the meeting. Is that possible? I, I would be happy to pass it along. I think it would be a great, you know, partnership. So, um, yes. Okay, good. Any other questions or business before we wrap up? I have one last thing. Sorry, mm -hmm. just popped sure. into my head. Um, the... The support services, our support services manager who works uh, in the in the town manager's office, um, sent us this email. Let me just see if I can share it with you all. Um, and I apologize, I just thought about it, but it's basically 
Um, they want us to, uh, you know, for us that are liaisons to commissions, to um, think about um, a, a community plan or any plan that will encompass uh, engagement with residents town-wide or plans that will impact the whole town. Now, I don't think that we're in the plans to impact the whole town, but perhaps uh, resident engagement, specifically to the community with disabilities. Um, so they kind of want us to think about what that looks like or what we're looking to accomplish and then log it into this Excel file that we're all sharing internally. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the end goal is, but I just wanted to point, point put it out there. I'm going to try to get more information. This was just sent to us last Wednesday, and for me, it's been crazy, and I haven't had a chance to follow up, but um, I'll try to get more information on this and then bring it back, but I just wanted to quickly mention it, that there, there, there is something that they're thinking about for boards and commissions to put forward their plans for community engagement. Great, and maybe we could talk more about it at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or topics? Jeannie, anything else? No. Nope. All right, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Anybody want to- I make a motion? motion to adjourn. All right, I'll take I that from Babs and a second from Maureen. <laughs> um, so I think we can adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Stop the recording. Um, and our next meeting is on October 17th. Um, I'll be